Sure, we do the grace and mercy of our Father and Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning. Today, as we finish up, wrap our stewardship emphasis up, we will look at the epistle today. Please join me in prayer. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would continue to help us grow, that stewardship is a privilege, and that in giving, we find it to be a joy and not give begrudgingly. Help us, O oh Lord, to be generous with what you have shared with us, and through our generosity moved by your Holy Spirit, your church may continue to grow through the gifts we give back to you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen. Friends in Christ, I never really loved this word, fundraising. Back in my days, DeMott, Indiana was on that little league board and I always regretted every spring when the board said, it's time to sell the candy bars. I always felt bad about that because my two sons, Micah and Seth, we really didn't have much extended family except in the church. Cecilia and I both agreed that it just wasn't the right thing for us to put candy bars at the church door and ask for our family to support our kids in Little League Baseball. It's just not the place for it. So every year I would just go back to the board, I'd hand the chocolate bars back to them in that big box and just say, look, I'll write you a check. And there I will for whatever you get from the sale, I'll just give to you directly because we're not selling them. They took it and Little League survives, survives to this day. So fundraising is never really something that uh, resonates us with human beings especially even myself. And when we talk about fundraising efforts, there are methodologies that people like to use to fundraise. First one is uh, they want to work on your sympathy. They want to show you pictures of people suffering. They want to let you know these people are hurting and you can help them in their grief. How many of you have not been moved by those Dogs, those sad dogs in those commercials. <laughs> Sympathy. It's a methodology. It's effective. Second one uh, that people use on is, is guilt. Are you doing your share? You can do better. I've heard some churches where people have access to giving records. Now I should go to the various homes and say, you can do better. Working on the guilt to increase fundraising efforts. You can do your share. Another methodology for fundraising is to uh, tell people that when you give, you're going to feel good about yourself. Helping people makes you feel better about your being, your world, it's a good gift that you receive when you give. Is that the type of methodology you want to work in Christianity, though? Are we just to give with the idea we're going to get back? I've always kind of been concerned about that tithing message, you know, that you give 10% to the Lord, he's going to give you money back. Because if that message comes out to a lot of hearers, they're going to walk away with saying, ah, the offering plate's a better investment than the stock market. I put money in, and I'm going to get it back. Not really a good methodology to think that we give for rewards. And finally, the other one that uh, I will share with you on a slide today is uh, working on your ego. I've heard some churches actually list top givers by name. And when they do... It serves nothing but the ego of the top givers and makes them think they're in total control of the church. And then everybody knows who the top givers are, so they need to pander to them rather than to giving submission to Christ. Methodologies you don't want to use when talking about stewardship in the church. We'll look at Paul today in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. He doesn't seem to use any of these four, but he uses another one that I don't have a slide for you with today, kind of like competition. 
He's got two churches he's dealing with. He's got churches at Macedonia, and he's got churches at Corinth or Achaia. And when he goes into Macedonia, according to what he says in 2 Corinthians 9, he says, I've been boasting about how you Corinthians are doing really well and giving way beyond your means. And then when he goes into Macedonia, he says that the other side is flipped. It's like, who can I give to get going better in giving? Almost the, the game of competition. Now, I've been involved in the fundraising effort using the game of competition. And it's usually something that it's a race you don't want to win in. Some years ago, we were raising funds for those animals like this church does, our Sunday school. It was their mission project. And the Sunday school said, let's raise a lot of money for the animals. And somebody came up with a harebrained idea that uh, we'll have a pig kissing contest. So my name was submitted plus another young teenager who was kind of popular, well-liked in the church. His name was Nathan. And the giving began. It was the first time I kept saying, I don't want to win this competition. <laughs> Every Sunday, the reports and the tallies were in. Nathan would be ahead one Sunday, and I would say, yes. The following Sunday, all of a sudden, my name was above his. I go, oh, no. And I would ask people, give to Nathan, give to Nathan. Well, when it was all said and done, guess who ended up kissing the pig? <laughs> we raised a lot of money, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I remember Mary Ann, I mean, there's a lot of pigs in Indiana. She had a little piglet, she brought it up to my face, and I kissed it on the side of, of the snout. And she says, uh-uh, <laughs> on the snout. And I said, no, I didn't raise enough money to do that. <laughs> Competition? Something that Paul seems to work at here between Macedonia and Corinth. But when you really look at Paul's methodology, what he uses to generate stewardship, is nothing really of those four, but he just simply uh, wants to preach the gospel. People have asked me over the years, Pastor Reva, what do you believe about stewardship? How do you generate good stewardship? And my response has been, I preach the gospel. For 36 years, this methodology has never failed me. 36 years, the church in Indiana, this church has not ever seen financial problems or concerns. God has provided. I think that's where we need to stay. Just like Paul does. Preach the gospel. The gospel is really made strong in Paul's letter to the Corinthians in chapter 8. For there he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus, enjoying the glamours of heaven, forsake all of that to come and humble himself to death on the cross. He became poor, so that all of us might become rich in righteousness. That's the gospel. And I don't know why, but that's what seems to basically work with people. Preach the gospel, and stewardship seems to take care of itself. If you begin to more focus on raising funds than preaching the gospel, the church has lost its focus. The gospel is what Paul preaches, and it is the methodology I wish to use in stewardship efforts in any church I serve. Preach the gospel of Christ. God has given us so much in Jesus Christ that people are going to be moved to say, how can I give back to you with cheerful, willing hearts? Paul goes on to say in this epistle today that true giving and true stewardship is not fundraising efforts, but to be looking upon it as efforts of ministry. Ministry means to serve. That Christ has done this for you. How now can I serve the church? Ministry is involved in serving the church and serving the poor. And sometimes the poor or those struggling in our life don't need our money. 
They simply may just need your time and your talent. People are hurting when they just need a friend. A friend that will put everything aside and just focus on their pain. That's ministry. That's what the church is in. It's not in fundraising. It's in ministry to the kingdom of God and to God's people. Many stewardship programs, of course, will follow this kind of a outline. We have in a minute here, the integrity question. Um, we'll get back into that. I'm getting ahead of myself for a second. But the integrity is what also Paul wishes to communicate with the people of Corinth. He said, you know, when I come to pick up the offering you're generating for the saints, what's the saints? They're the ones in Jerusalem. Apparently they're experiencing a famine. They need some money to buy food. Paul is picking up an offering for those people in Jerusalem. And the Corinthians have made a promise. We're going to do really well in this. We want to minister to the saints. Paul is finding out that for some reason things are getting a little slow over there. And in his letter to Corinthians, he encourages them to carry through with their promise. Which in other words is why I got this slide of integrity up there. That's what integrity means, carrying through with what you've said. So we have an opportunity every year. The Stewardship Board encourages you to have your conversation and talk with God of where you are in your stewardship of time, treasures, and talents. It's a conversation that should happen probably more than once a year. But we want to make sure it at least happens at least once a year. We give opportunity to you to have you write it down. There's something said about when you write something down, it becomes more meaningful for people. And therefore, after you write it down, you make your promise to God. The gift of integrity will see to it that you carry it out. This is what Paul says in Corinth. You've made a promise. Carry it through. Be people of integrity in your stewardship giving, and your stewardship commitments. And now we move on to that other slide. I was ahead of myself on what most stewardship programs involve. Involve these bullet points. Uh, the committee is organized and meets regularly. Our stewardship board does. Assignments are made and carried out, what each person on the board is supposed to do. Budgets are developed. The ministry of the church is interpreted. Sermon sins on stewardship is preached, like we've done for the last three Sundays here. And challenges are extended. But it's missing one fundamental thing. That when we go out and encourage people to be nurtured in the faith in God, we do disservice as a church. We do not become good stewards in the church if we don't tell people about the cost of discipleship. I've had so many people tell me about churches reaching many people. You see how many people they're reaching? You see how full their church is? And I've always asked the question, well, they may be reaching many, but the church needs to be transforming the many. That's where Christ the King, under my direction, is trying to accomplish. We just don't want to reach out to people. We want to transform people. We want to transform them into disciples of Christ, done by the power of the Holy Spirit, done by the gospel. Preach the gospel. Transformation takes place. And when we are transformed in Christ, our gifts to God are not an exaction, they're not an extraction, but they are gifts cheerfully given. I've had people tell me over the years in the ministry, they'll look at this verse and say, well, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Well, that leaves me out. I'll ask, but are you even having prayers with God about this? Because I don't see how we cannot be but cheerful givers when we focus on what God has done for us in Jesus. We are in the business of proclaiming the gospel that seeks to transform people into disciples of Christ 
where their giving will not be a form of exaction or extraction, but a form of willingness, of gratefulness, of cheerfulness. In his name, amen. amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Heard the word of the Lord.